very good evening one and all so uh, today's lecture is by dr hima john me who is a reader at anu dental college uh, she did a bds in oxford dental college and mds in by the institute of dental sciences uh, she is well versed with cpct and reporting uh, she has a, won many awards in uh, na national conferences she has many publications in national and international journals i welcome you doctor uh, please can take over and, and thank you doctor yeah. so uh, first of all thank you asmik for giving me this platform and it's a very nice way that all of us are getting to interact like this and because i personally know very few people here because i did my uh, study outside of kerala and this is indeed a nice platform where all of us you know can meet even though not you know meet in person but we can stay in touch okay so today my topic is butterfly effect it is just a small simple topic with a fancy name that's all so what is this butterfly effect okay so basically uh, in chaos theory what happens is they say that something as you know insignificant as a flapping of a butterfly wing can eventually cause a tornado okay so that is what butterfly effect means so what is it in our context like why is it important for us as oral physicians now basically what happens is small changes or reactions happening in our body can have a massive effect on our oral health and at the same time gets you know if it it affects our systemic health also so what are these small things or small changes which could eventually lead to something big okay now all of us are aware of something called as psychosomatic disorders okay now that is at, at least for me personally when i was a student psychosomatic disorder was something which i hated which i didn't like studying at all okay so thing is if we look you know more deeply into those disorders the small things which happens in our day to day life has a big effect in the future for us okay so if we do not you know rectify it soon enough it might lead to something for worse in the future so what are these things you know which affects us in our day to day life there's something called as good or you know the happy hormones which our body produces and at the same time we have stress or anxiety related hormones now we need a good balance of both of these for our well being okay now if it's our feel good hormones also it is not produced always in our body at the same time if we have a uh, little amount of stress yes is required but if it is more than what is required it is obviously going to hurt us so now what are these feel good hormones or you know good feelings where does it come from now basically there are four main hormones known as the dopamine endorphin oxytocin serotonin now these are the hormones which help us stay happy okay so we need a good balance of these to you know to maintain our uh, equilibrium in the in our body now brain chemicals are nature's global positioning system so you need happy chemicals to motivate us to reach a reward whereas you need unhappy chemicals also you know to help us run away from danger okay so in my future slides you will be seeing a lot of this lion and zebra so it will you know give us a picture of what i'm trying to convey so now if you see this in the uh, on my left that is there is a picture of a lion chasing a zebra now in the lion the happy chemicals or the good hormones are taking over why because the lion knows that if it catches the zebra eventually it's going to get a reward okay but at the same time the stress related hormones are at the peak in the zebra because the zebra knows if it does not escape the lion's catch obviously it's going to die so now these feel good chemicals are not meant to flow all the time for no reason okay so there is a time where all these chemicals are released into our body now happy chemicals turn on in short spurts so you always have to do more to get to get more of these chemicals now all these chemicals which you know which these so called good chemicals or you know feel good hormones they are controlled by neural pathways built from a past experience okay so in the past you did a good job 
you got you know you got appreciated for it so you feel good so you know that if you probably repeat the same thing you are going to be appreciated so that's how our body works so whatever turned on your chemicals in the past built pathways that turn them turn them on today also because that is how our brain is designed to work as simple as that so let's see what triggers happy chemicals in mammals so first happy chemical i'm going to be talking about is dopamine okay so dopamine is a great feeling that a reward is at hand that is basically we get appreciated for the work we do small examples is you know you have a student she gets good marks or he gets good marks and they get appreciated for their good marks by their parents or teachers so that moment you know that feeling which we get is because of the release of dopamine now at the same time when we go for the first day of work we are excited you know we are looking forward for something though it might eventually change but yeah so the first day of work is always special so that is also because of the release of this happy hormone known as dopamine now dopamine also releases energy for the chase so as we can see again we are back to the lion uh, and the zebra so a lot of dopamine is released in the lion to chase the zebra okay that is when you want a reward at the end your body releases dopamine now the good feeling of dopamine motivates you to take those particular steps that help you get a reward okay so the thing is it is very short lived so once you get a reward the dopamine drops until you set your sight on another reward next is oxytocin okay so next feel good hormone is oxytocin so now this happy kid here in the picture is my son and he's being tossed into the air by his father okay but he's still smiling that's because there is something known as a bonding hormone or love chemical so that is being released in our body when our loved ones touch us hug us and all that okay so it creates a feeling that it is safe to let your guard down with the people you trust now oxytocin is stimulated in our body by various ways like for example it is stimulated by trust by touch by birth by hug by intimacy okay now this is very important especially in small children okay so when they're feeling sad uh, you just give them a hug they will feel much much better like even for us like suppose you're feeling down or if you're feeling depressed if someone just comes to you and talks to you you know, just pats your back and says it's going to be all right it does make a lot of difference because knowingly or unknowingly our body or our or our brain you know starts stimulating oxytocin which helps us lower our guard and makes us feel better now another thing is our brain is evolved to make careful decisions about when to turn on the oxytocin because trusting everyone would not promote survival okay so that is why if you know it's our natural instinct to make decisions on whether to trust someone or not okay so if you build trust obviously small amounts of oxytocin is going to be released oxytocin again is also soon metabolized so we have to keep stimulating it in order to enjoy that nice safe feeling next hormone i'm going to be talking about is serotonin okay serotonin is basically the pleasure of so social dominance now probably now my serotonin level will be slightly higher than everyone probably listening to this why because i'm the one who's going on talking with the small hope that people are listening and they're going to be benefited by some or the other way so when you're giving a talk or when you're educating others or when you feel that probably you're doing something which is going to benefit others that is when our body releases serotonin okay it also helps us regulate your it also helps you regulate your mood as well as your sleep appetite digestion learning ability and also memory now basically serotonin is not aggression it's not like i'm a dictator here who's going on talking something it is a calm sense that yes like how the monkey is saying i will get the banana okay so it is that sense of staying calm and not being aggressive even though you're taking the center stage now it is easy to see this in others but it's also you uh, useful to recognize your own natural urge for social dominance so this is also good or uh, this hormone is also required in small amounts for us 
to have the feeling of being accepted socially and also give us a feeling of well-being. Now serotonin, serotonin is also soon reabsorbed. Now that is a disadvantage with all these feel-good hormones. They are released easily and at the same time it is also metabolized very easily. Next is endorphin. Okay, so now we are back to this lion who has been chasing the zebra but the poor zebra seems to have given up and the lion has attacked or pounced on zebra. Now all this time we were only worried about the zebra. You know, we were praying that zebra somehow runs away, gets away from the lion. At the same time, we are not realizing the amount of effort put in by the lion to attack the zebra. Okay, so even though the lion is in pain, you know, the lion is also tired chasing the zebra, but what is it that, you know, keeps the lion going, even though its muscles are aching, it's in pain, the hormone which is responsible for it to keep going is something which is known as endorphin. Okay, so basically endorphin is a euphoria that masks pain. That is, it is, it is basically your body's natural pain reliever. Okay, so we as a mammal or as a human being, as a homo sapien rather, we are not you know meant for physical vigorous activities okay so we are not designed to inflict pain on ourselves we are designed for survival so what happens is suppose you're going on a flat surface you didn't notice that there was water you trip and you fall or if someone or any of us have had a fracture you would realize that initially there is no pain it is a sense of numbness okay so this numbness is brought about by this hormone known as endorphin, okay? So it is evolved for emergencies in us and it is not for pleasure, okay? Fortunately, we also get a good bit of endorphin from vigorous exertion, okay? You do a good amount of exercise, it relaxes your body and you get a good amount of sleep. At the same time, you would have also noticed that children who have cried their hearts out or lungs out, eventually falls asleep. Okay, that is because of the release of endorphin, which helps them calm down, okay? So the parts you built before the age of eight and during the puberty are the super highways for your brain, okay? So they say they, you know, there's always a saying, catch them young, you know, teach them young, so that eventually when they grow up, their good habits will progress, okay? So anything you want to do with your body or you want to do with someone, you want to inf you want to inculcate good habits, it is always to do it before the age of eight because our body naturally, you know, it becomes our body's natural tendency to keep that progress, you know, uh, steady. Like a small example is, I am, uh, I cannot skate, okay? I cannot skate. So probably if you ask me to start learning skating now, it would be difficult. It would be very, very difficult for me because first of all, I would be apprehensive that I'm going to fall. So if you do the same thing with a child, it is easier for them to learn. Probably give them, you know, a week or two, they will be probably perfect in it. Okay, so that's the difference. So teach them young is what everyone says. That's because that is when our neural pathway have a lot of myelin. Okay, so when you have a lot of myelin, it is always uh, easier to inculcate good habits. Okay, so basically myelin insulates neurons and makes them super efficient. So that is why when you have a good amount of myelin in your body, it is always to make the best use of it at that particular age. So whatever you do with your myelinated neurons feels very natural, normal and easy. Okay, so for someone who's been skating from their childhood, you ask them to skate, it is absolutely normal for them. But for someone like me who doesn't know absolutely how to skate or any other skill which I'm not at all familiar with, it would be difficult for me to learn it at this age. I'm not saying you will not learn. You will find it apprehensive at first, but then when you're at a younger age, it comes naturally. So when you try something new, it feels difficult, wrong, and sometimes dangerous too. Now, a small example is first extraction that all of us did, probably in third BDS. Before the patient fainted, sometimes, you know, one of us would have fainted because we were that apprehensive. But as now, you know, we are all so much more into the field. We are obviously not all that scared of simple extractions. Okay, so that is a small example. 
that when you do something for the first time, you're really scared. But then when you keep doing it over time, you become experts in it. So that's what I said. Fortunately, you can build new pathways to turn, to turn on your chemical uh, in new ways. So repetition is what it takes after you after your mile in years. Okay, so if I want to learn skating now, I can, but I just have to put the effort which is required to learn that particular new skill. So in short, to build a new dopamine circuit, focus on a goal, and take a small step each day. Now build a new oxytocin circuit each day by taking a small step towards social trust. And build a new serotonin circuit by taking a small step towards social importance each day. Now, why is this important? Okay, so why am I telling all this to us, uh, you know, oral physicians? Now, all this is important because when you treat a patient with psychosomatic disorder, you don't know what is going on in their body. Okay, so there might be some kind of a stressor which is present in them, which could be leading to all this. So if we can probably educate them about all these, it would help us in treating them also. So next thing I'm going to be talking about is about stress and anxiety. As we all know, there are a lot of negative uh, effects of increased cortisol levels in our body. Okay, You will be having increased blood sugar level, increased weight gain, depressed or suppressed immune system, digestive problems, heart diseases. Okay. We all know all these have a lot of um, negative effects on our body. So what happens in our body when you are subjected to stress? Okay, so according to uh, the biopsychosocial model of uh, illness, which was proposed by Engel and later modified by a lot of his co-workers, it suggests that any illness is caused due to interaction of mainly three factors. That is your uh, biological factor, psychological factor and social factor. For example, commonest thing which you can think about is HIV infection. Okay, so the biological agent is a virus, psychological agent is stress and loneliness and social, it is a drive to probably commit suicide. Now, if you all remember exactly like say 10 months ago, when you know all of us uh, were stuck during the lockdown, okay, probably March, late March or April, I'm sure all of us would have gone through some kind of a stress, you know, thinking, you know, what if I'm going to contract COVID-19, okay? Probably like all of us are healthcare workers. We are at risk for, you know, contracting the disease. So that initial, you know, that um, anxiety would obviously be there with all of us. So that is why all these, you know, biological, psychological and social uh, aspect of illness can be seen in any uh, disease that we can take, okay? Now, why is our oral region or, you know, why there are oral manifestations of these particular disorders, okay? So as we have all learned earlier, oral and perioral areas are more prone to systemic changes, okay? Face and mouth are special areas for a person since the face identifies oneself. Circumoral musculature gives a sensu um, sensual satisfaction from early childhood, like suckling a mother's teeth, then going through transient gratification of thumb sucking, lip sucking, and other oral habits. Adolescence, there is pencil sucking, chewing, and in, adult, in late adult, in adulthood, there is satisfying sexual zone for erotic stimulation and all that, okay? So our oral or perioral areas have a lot of significance for us as an individual, okay? So that is why anything which is going wrong in our systemic body is expressed in our oral cavity and at the same time anything wrong in our oral cavity also signifies or has a significant role in our general well-being also. So neurotransmitter response to stress can be the stressors of many kinds are there which activates our noradrenergic system in the brain and this in turn releases a lot of catecholamines from the ANS. So chronic stress may dump an ANS response to that particular stress. But what happens is when we are under constant stress, even a minute or a small, uh, you know, a, an insignificant thing also can lead to a lot of anxiety or stress built up in us. Okay. So what happens is it all these builds up over time and it reaches a peak. So there are, there's been a lot of studies in the past, you know, which shows that when your body is under constant stress, it leads to a lot of other 
adverse effects. Now, we are, if we have read any article about psychosomatic disorders, we would have come across this particular flowchart where you know that if there is constant presence of psychological stress and if there is no adequate coping from the patient's end or from the individual's end, there is constant relief of your cortisol releasing hormone. Now, at the same time, what happens is because there is constant release of hormone, there is increased level of adrenal cortisol. And because of all these increased level of these anxiety hormones, there is depressed immunity. So when your body is, uh, you know, uh, immune response is very little, any small infection or inflammation is going to get doubled or even tripled. So any small amount of uh, oral irritation or oral inflammation can lead to a lot of other diseases. Okay, so that is why if there is no adequate coping from the patient's end, it is a it is very difficult to treat the patient as such. Now, a brief classification of various psychosomatic disorders that you know we have learned about in the past. That is, it can be classified as oral psychosomatic disorders, where we have oral lichen planus, recurrent after stomatitis, uh, glossitis, stomatitis area, uh, your geographic tongue. Then oral diseases in which psychological factors may play an etiological role, like your erythema multiform and all that. Next is oral infection in which emotion may be a predisposing factor, like your recurrent herpes labialis, anag. Then oral diseases induced by neurotic habits, that is from other habits, you end up getting uh, oral diseases like leukoplakia, chewing of oral mucosa and all that. And neurotic oral symptoms like glossodynia, glossopyrosis, burning mouth syndrome. Okay, We have our own uh, Indian author classification given by Belur and Nagesh. So which can be divided into temporomandibular pain dysfunction syndrome, burning mouth syndrome, and various other diseases which come under it. Okay. So these are the other disorders which can come under your psychosomatic disorders. So basically the whole point of this particular, you know, butterfly effect or emphasizing on the amount of, you know, how we should help our patients increase our good hormones or feel good hormones, okay? We have been treating patients with psychosomatic disorders daily, you know, on day-to-day -day basis. We're seeing patients with lichen planus, we're seeing, we're seeing patients with geographic tongue, okay? So we obviously know it is not something which you prescribe a medicine and yes, you know, the disease disappears, no. So what we can do to help our patients, okay, probably is to help them increase their feel good hormones, okay? So what we can probably tell our patients are get the right amount of sleep, exercise, but obviously not too much that you're too fatigued to go or to fall asleep. Learn to recognize stressful thinking. Okay, that is very important because we might not be aware of what is, you know, stressing us. But if you learn to recognize it, or if you learn, if you ask the patient to recognize their stressful thinking, it will obviously help them. Learn to relax, have fun. You know, you can have fun with your colleagues, you can have fun with your family, children, friends, anyone, okay? So it is very important to educate them to let go for a brief moment of time. Maintain healthy relationships, be it in your family or personal life or workplace. It is very important to maintain healthy relationships because eventually it is going to affect your health and no one else's. So take care of a pet if it is possible. Be your best self whenever possible. Tend to your spirituality because that is also an important part of our lives and eat healthy food, okay? So this is all the small tips or, you know, suggestions which we could give to our patients who are suffering with psychosomatic disorders. Because, uh, yes, medicine does help, but we need to also go deeper into probably identifying what could be wrong in their, you know, ANS system or whatever so that we could probably help them feel better. So that is what I have to tell. So nothing will work unless you do. So until and unless you want to make a change, you have to start from yourself and no one else is going to do it for you. So that is how it's going to be for the patient also. We can prescribe them medicines, but the patient also has to put some amount of effort to probably increase the amount of feel good hormones in their body. Thank you.
thank you dr hema uh, so that was a very wonderful short and very sweet uh, presentation sure a lot of things that we already know but when put it in a manner like that there's a lot to think about right like even i now i used to like psychosomatic disorders when learning them and all that. but yeah it plays a very important role and we do see patients every day who has uh, with just inducing stress uh, everything gets worse okay maybe a small problem uh, but because of their stress they're not able to manage they're not able to take their medications and everything goes away right? anyway so any doubts from the uh, audience if anybody wants to ask doubts okay. Uh, I would like to ask a doubt. Hi, hi, hi good evening, hi, Hima. Hima, yeah, thank you very evening, much. Sir. Nice presentation. I joined a bit late, so uh, I don't know whether you've already mentioned what about this, but I think I need to know this, so I'm asking. Uh, these psychosomatic patients, uh, is yes. there any uh, biochemical investigation by which we can do any assessment on them? So probably, what could what we could do. is probably check their cortisol levels that is a small probable thing which we could do because uh, people who are under constant stress their cortisol level is um, obviously going to be very higher so probably we could get their uh, cortisol level tested so that could probably give us an idea of if they are under constant stress i uh, i check the serotonin levels also okay uh, but cortisol yes i think i need to start adding it in the investigation uh, chart thank you so much thank you sir. dr vivek has come online hello there hello i am audible my microphone is not working yes sir yeah audible sir so it is a nice presentation very uh, like it is it is actually up in the current scenario because we get lot of uh, patients with uh, psychosomatic disorder yes sir and uh, the current scenario actually all of us and, and have you ever tried uh, taking a, a questionnaire uh, which will probably give you an idea regarding their depression anxiety and so Yes, sir. Uh, till now, no, sir. I have not done any uh, questionnaire. But the, uh, what happens is all these patients, like, if we ask them, are you stressed? Like, day-to-day -day basis, not nothing like a study or anything. Like, uh, we ask them, are you stressed? First thing they are obviously going to tell us, no, I'm not stressed. But then if we ask them, like, what, what, you know, what they work with, or uh, you know, probably if it's a housewife, what time do they get up? So they, you know. Just having a small, simple conversation with them itself will probably give you an idea of you know, what is going on in their personal life. So, what is the issue? Because, uh, as you said, like, uh, earlier, Swedish madam also used to say uh, that they should just speak to the patient uh, regarding their efforts uh, or whatever. If you are willing to give an ear to what they have to say, probably they will come up with more and more details regarding. Yes. the psychosomatic part of the disease and uh, very very recently like, like we were doing a uh, study on the stress related uh, stress related to online teaching or online online uh, teaching on students not exactly video students but uh, school students so here uh, we used a questionnaire which is called as dash score bas score So you have two types of scores. That is, two DAS is 21 and DAS is 42. So DAS is 42 essentially means that you have uh, 42 questions which a person can answer. And based on that uh, answers uh, to the questions, you can evaluate the depression, anxiety, and stress uh, on a basis. So if uh, I think uh, it is an uh, like if some of us at least can. Start off a procedure by which, along with our case reports, we take a scoring sheet of this DAS score. Probably we can have an idea regarding the psychosomatic aspect of a disease. 
Iron Man was with uh, thinking about that. So anyway, we will be uh, like uh, for pain uh, evaluation and everything. We probably will be using some kind of a GIS uh, score sheet. Uh, so along with that, you can see another score sheet of uh, this either 21 or uh, 42, whatever, which is convenient for you in your practice. So I think this might be an eye opener, definitely. But I don't know, like as uh, Dr. Tattoo said, is there any biochemical parameter which we can probably ascertain? But I think it's difficult. I don't know. But if somebody else has any opinion regarding that, it can be fine. It was a nice presentation. Vivek, uh, to add on to your this thing, we have done a study with uh, uh, checking the estrogen level in postmenopausal ladies. Uh -huh. Estrogen is lower in patients with uh, lichen planus. Okay.